much. Wang Shang Hao. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Gift Tona from the analytical department. Uh, this is my second time presenting here. Yes, but today we've prepared something a little bit different from the uh, from the first time that we presented. So I want to keep it interactive as possible. So if you don't ask me questions, I'll ask you questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we'll start our presentation with a small introduction of what is analytical department. <coughs> so analytical department is a department that uses various techniques to identify the chemical makeup or characteristics of a particular sample. So our department is divided into three parts. This is Weybridge, where the raw materials and uh, concentrate come, and also the acid. Then we have uh, the second, which is the main laboratory, the center of all analysis. And then we have the blister and anode copper weighing. This is where we weigh our finished product, which is copper and uh, copper anodes and copper blisters. So we move on to our key 20 words. So the first word that we have is quantitative. In basic English language, to quantify something is to determine its amount. I'll give you the scientific one. The scientific one in the lab, we say quant quantitative is simply to determine the amount of the elements present in that particular sample. So we call it quantitative analysis, determination of the amount of elements present in a particular sample or material. And then the second word is qualitative. Qualitative is uh, identification of what type of elements are present in a particular sample. So like us, we're interested in 14 elements of interest. We're interested in copper, we're interested in iron, we're interested in silica, uh, sulfur, zinc, and so on and so on, but there are 14. We do qualitative analysis, we determine what elements are present. So we move on to the third one, which is uh, reproducibility. So it comes to the produce. To produce something, it has to come up the same. In terms of chemistry, reproducibility is, uh, is an agreement between measurements that have been done under changed conditions. So in a simple example, I'll give you in the lab what we do. So under chemical analysis, we've got what we call titrations. So if I do a titration, I get my result of copper to be maybe 60. And then I use another method. Maybe I use instrumentation. I use XRF. XRF is simply X-ray first and spectrometer. If I use machine analysis to say analyze the same sample, it should give me 60 percent copper, then we say that result is reproducibility. So the simple definition of reproducibility is agreement of results of the same measurements under changed conditions. And then we have the fourth one, repeatability. To repeat something is to do it over and over again. This is almost the opposite of the reproducibility. Repeatability is simply having agreement of measurements done in the same condition. It means if I analyze my titration, I get the copper, 60. Mr. Wang also analyzes through the titration, you should get the copper, 60. And then we move on to the next one, which is accuracy. Accuracy is simply having uh, closeness of your objective or your result to the true value. But in chemistry, as we use it in terms of result, Accuracy is how close your result is to the true or acceptable value. And then precision. Yes, it comes with the word precise. I'll give you an example of the data. If you hit the bullseye, we say you're accurate. You've hit the true value. But with precision, you can have close results to one another, but they're not close to the true value. That's being precise. So if you're hitting your darts on 10, you hit another one on 10, you hit another one on 10, it means they're being precise. But are you close to the true value? No. So precision is basically the closeness of results to each other, but not to the true value. So you, but you can also be precise and accurate at the same time. We move on to the next one, which is validation. So when you validate a method, it means you have proven that this method I have validated, it will give me a better result at the end. So validation is simply proving an analytical method that it's true and accurate. The second one is traceability. So traceability is simply to find the root or origin where something is coming from. 
And then we move on to the word, when you say a method is reliable, it means even if another company uses that same method to determine the result, with us also it, be, it should be the same. A method is reliable, it means it can be done even the second time, it will give you a good result. It can be done even by other companies, the same method, it will give you the same result. And then we have the tenth word, which is uncertainty. When you're not uncertain, it means you're not sure about something. Huh? I can tell you, re results in the lab, there's no true result, but there's a range of results. So we use the uncertainty to give us an allowance of that re result. To uncertainty is to give a range on a certain known value of the results. It should have the lower and the upper limit to the true value. This way, mostly, we even use it uh, on, on calibrations. When you're calibrating an instrument, you have to know in the range on which the true value is, but you give it, it should fall in that other value plus or minus from the true value. Then we move on to the next word, which is uh, homogeneous. Homo means same. So this one, we use it for material. We know we receive the copper concentrate. We have to say, is it homogeneous? Is it same? So homogeneous is simply a material that is same or has a similar kind of material. The opposite of homogeneous is heterogeneous. Hetero is different. So it means you have a material which has, maybe you've received concentrate, it has lumps, it has powder, it has stones. We say that material is heterogeneous. It means it's not the it's not same, it's different from each other. It's not pure, it has impurities. So we move on to the next word, which is range. Range is simply an interval in which results lie. Basically, it's the upper and the lower limit of detection. That's what we call a range. Then we move on to the 14th word, which is standard. In terms of chemistry, a standard is a, a known solution, which we know its concentration, that we can use to determine the concentration of the other. That's the standard. So I use a standard. A standard is something that you know of its weight, its volume, its mass. You have details about it so that you can use it to adjust your scale. Then we go on to calibration. Calibration is, happens everywhere. Even when adjusting the projector, he was calibrating it. He was trying to focus to make sure that the graphics look nice. Calibration basically is to get accurate results of your instrument or your analytical process. In chemistry, there's what we call calibration lines. So this is a good calibration. This is an off calibration on the lower side. And then this is a high calibration. So the reason why we do the calibrations, we try to bring to the normal because our graph should be a straight line passing through the origin. And then we move on to the 16th word, which is titration. Yes, a titration is basically an experiment, an experiment in which we have a known volume and we know its a concentration, then we use it to determine an unknown solution of which we know its volume to determine the concentration. And then next we move on to endothermic. So the word endo means inside. So endothermic reactions are reactions that require energy in form of light or heat. For them to take place, they will need energy. Then number 18, exothermic. Exo means outside. These are reactions that give out energy in form of light or heat. We move on to the 19th word, which is oxidation. Oxidation has got three definitions. It can be addition of oxygen, or it can be removal of hydrogen, and also loss of electrons. So oxidation mostly it's used uh, at anode furnace there. They have to oxidize the copper. They have to reduce it, oxidize it. In the lab, oxidation simply, we say addition of oxygen. Say I'm drilling my copper sample, then because of heat and because of the oxygen, I get a copper oxide. It means this sample now has oxidized. So when a sample gets oxidized, the company can lose money because you are not selling pure copper we are selling oxidized copper, so it means its quality has reduced. So we have to avoid oxidation when we're working. So then the last word is reduction. Reduction is simply the removal of oxygen. It's the opposite of oxidation. Removal of oxygen and addition of hydrogen and electrons. So what does my department role in CCS? My department role in CCS is for quality inspection of raw materials such as copper concentrate, silica sand, limestone, coal, charcoal, all the raw materials we have to inspect that are of good quality because we are buying. If we don't inspect them, maybe they are not of good quality, the company can end up losing money. Also, it's to quality inspect our finished product, which is blister copper and anode, so that we, sh we ensure that we're not selling poor quality. When we sell, the, our blister goes to China or London Metal Stock Exchange, it's of good quality. Weighing and sampling of the raw material. So we wait to determine its mass, then we also sample to determine the quality of the sample. Then also it monitors the process control. Our job starts when the raw material enters 
until it's fed in the, in the smelter, we'll also take samples, we'll be analyzing in, at each and every stage. We'll be analyzing when you get the mat, the mat is split to the slug, they take it to the electric furnace, we'll be analyzing until the final product of our copper. We'll always be checking the processes to ensure that there's good quality control and quality assurance. We are monitoring every stage of the material. We also perform quantitative and qualitative analysis of the material. So we go on to the first section. Our first section there is a web bridge. This is in charge of receiving the raw materials such as the copper, concentrate, and also we weigh and sample, and sample them at the web bridge. And then a, a sample will be sent to the laboratory for analysis. So what happens at the, at the web bridge? When a truck comes, it's firstly inspected. We check if it has the seals. The seals, they open the seals. When open the seals, they open the tent. We check the material, is the material homogeneous or not? Is it same or not? If the material is good, we'll go on to wait and then we sample it. And then the truck goes and offloads. So what happens at Webridge also, we do the sampling. After sampling, we'll prepare the sample. After we prepare the sample, we'll prepare the moisture and the quality sample. Then we'll further do the moisture determination there and send the dry sample to the laboratory for analysis. Yes. And then all the information that are captured by the web bridge are sent in the MES system. So this is a simple flow diagram showing the process of handling of copper concentrate. So when a truck of copper concentrate comes, they will dig uh, about seven holes, in about 30 to 40 centimeters. Then we have a sampling spear which goes down, deep down the truck to be able to take the bottom sample. We sample that, we put it in a bucket, then we move on to the mixing. Under the mixing room, we we'll homogenize the sample, try to make it same, because we're sampling at different points. So we we'll try to homogenize it. After we homogenize it, we'll make a 20 square grid. Then from each portion, we get the sample and package it into three different plastics. One for moisture, one for reserve, and one for sending to the lab. Then from there, we'll do sample preparation. Sample preparation is making a sample ready for analysis. So we have uh, our molar machines that will pulverize the sample to powder. Pulverization is simply making a sample in a form of powder. When you have something in form of powder, it's easy to dissolve during digestion of the sample. Next section is the blister and anode section. Uh, before we used to do the inspection, where we check for specifications of the of the anode produced. So when we see when you do at the blister, we we'll make sure that the blister passes. It's of good quality that we want to produce to, to sell to our clients. So we inspect it, then we wait in form of bundles. If it's blister, we just wait in form of uh, one bundle on a platform scale. Then this is a, a preparation of anode. I'll give a short video. As it's going on, I'll be explaining. So this is a short video that shows a preparation of a blister ingots. Blister ingots are sampled at the smelter with a standard scoop. Then they are drilled until it penetrates through. Then we're also putting alcohol, we're putting alcohol here to prevent oxidation because we said when there's heat, our copper can get oxidized. Then we also, when you get the cuttings, we'll use a magnet to remove uh, any iron impurities. Then because we're using alcohol, we'll dry in the dry box for, for 30 minutes at 60 degrees to remove the alcohol. Then we'll put in our bomb use to pulverize for about 20 seconds to make that powder form. So you pulverize for 20 seconds to grind it. Then we sieve. We sieve under a 20 mesh. Everything has to pass through under 20 mesh. Then again, we sieve under a 40 mesh. Then we get the top and the bottom sample. Then we will package it. So there they are simply sieving under a, under a 20 mesh or 40 mesh. Then we we'll put in a mixing chamber to homogenize it, to make it same. Yeah, it's been sieved. Then that's how it looks, huh? Yeah. Powdery. Then we'll make a 16 square grid. Then we'll package into six aluminum foil plastics. Two for the buyer, two for the seller, two for umpire. So these aluminum foil uh, bags we use are, one, they prevent light from passing through and moisture from entering. So it means we create its original material. 
Okay, they are sealed like that. I think we're done. Yeah. Yes, can you pause for me? Yeah. So we go on to the main laboratory. We had said the main purpose of the laboratory is to prepare, is to analyze, to prepare sample to analyze and to test them. So whatever sample that we receive, it will undergo sample preparation. So the center lab helps to check raw materials, plant controls, and finished products, and we give the grade to marketing, then marketing will be able to bill our clients. If I don't have this document, I will not test that sample. So the base is to come to lab, you get an application of material analysis. When you get these documents, it's signed by, it's, it's filled in and signed, then I'll be able to analyze for you. So sample preparation technique. So sample preparation technique are stage-wide reductions of additional subsampling steps to preserve the representativeness of the sample. So when, it, in a, when a material goes under sample preparation, we're trying to make it ready for analysis. So we can't analyze that whole blister. We have to reduce it in size. And when we reduce the site, we have to have a good quality, which can easily be dissolved by the acid for us to test in the lab. So that's the importance of sample preparation. Sample preparation stages are weighing, homogenizing, sieving, pulverizing, square grid, reduction, by coning and cottering. So these are some of the, the machines we use for sample preparation. This is a, a grinding mill machine, which we use for pulverizing. You saw in the video, they were putting in there for 20 seconds. After you put the whole uh, cuttings, they'll come out as, as a powder. Then you have the crushers. Sometimes the mat is uh, maybe five millimeter. We have to crush it a bit before we can pulverize it. A powder form, easy to analyze powder. So types of analysis. I would say there are two types of analysis. We have chemical and instrumentation. Under chemical analysis, we have titrations, acid-based titrations, short iodide titrations. And then under instrumental analysis, we have machine and equipment analysis, where we're using the XRF machine, the OES machine, and the oxygen analyzer, and the electrogovernmetric analysis to test our sample. So this is an example of an instrumentation analysis. This is an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer machine that we use to analyze uh, plant samples. I will just give you a brief principle about this machine. I won't go into details because it will be teaching chemistry now. It has an X-ray tube. So this tube has electricity passing through it. So when this bombards in a sample, let me do some little bit of chemistry. This is a sample. It looks like the chemistry of the sample. We have the nucleus here. Then we have the shells. So we have two electrons here. Here we have eight electrons. When the X-ray tube is excited, it will remove an electron in the innermost shell. It will remove an electron, which we call a photoelectron. It will remove this electron. It means when it removes this electron, there will be a vacancy. There will be instability. So one of the electrons in the outermost shell will go and cover this. So when this happens, it will give what we call photoelectrons in form of light. When you get these reactions, light is given up. That same light, we're able to use a detector to calculate its intensity, that how much light has been produced, and we marry the light to the concentration. That's how we're able to determine the concentrations of elements using this machine. Because the light produced, the fluorescent light produced, we marry it with concentration of each particular element in there. So this, this is used for analysis of plant control processes. We use it for samples from ISA smelter up to slug flotation. We're able to test. It can do almost all the elements in the periodic table except the noble gases and the rare earth metals. But all of, their, all of the metals that can do in three minutes, it can give me the result, this machine. To other sample preparation methods of the XRF machine. So, it has two types of methods that we're using to test. The first one is the pressed pellets. We have that special machine, the pressing machine. So what you simply do is get the ring, put your pervarite sample there, press it at 40 Newton, and then you're going to get a pellet looking like that, which the XRF can, uh, can be able to analyze. And then the second one is a fused glass bead. A fused glass bead, we use a flux, then we put in some reducing agent, sodium nitrate, and the sample. And then we put in a muffle furnace for 15 minutes. Then we put in a, in a shaking furnace using special crucibles, PT crucibles. Then it's able to give us a fused glass bead like that, which we can be able to analyze using the machine. Then we have a special machine there. 
the magnetic analyzer, the one we use for analysis of Fe304, magnet, magnetite. Okay, we go, we're still on chemical analysis. We have other machines we're using to do chemical analysis. We have the Leco oxygen analyzer. This, is, we use it for analysis of oxygen at uh, anode furnace. Then we have the Spark OES. The Spark OES also, we use it for analysis of the, 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 the sample ingots at, 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 at anode. This one, we're able to determine the impurities present in the anode. Because when you're, when you're selling copper, you remove the impurities first. Copper is about 99.95, so the rest of the 0 0.5 is the impurities, so we determine the impurities. And then we use the polishing machine to make the samples for the uh, OES. And then here we have a special electrogovernmetric machine, the EG, which we use to determine the copper in the anode. And then that's an example of an oxygen sample. It comes in a rod shaped, in a, the sampled in a glass rod shaped. We remove the glass and we have that rod, we'll cut it to small pieces, then we're able to analyze in the sample. And then we have carbon and sulfur analyzers. So these are the ones that we use to analyze uh, carbon and sulfur in the material. We also have uh, the bomb calorimeters, which are using to analyze coal and charcoal. And then we have special instruments we're using for fluorines. Fluorine in acid, we can use the, uh, the working electrode for fluorine. Then we have the cobalt potentiometric machine. It's an auto titrator. It can be able to titrate and give us the cobalt result. Then we have the AS machine. The AS machine, we use it for trace elements. It can be in water, the trace elements, the elements that are in small quantities. Okay, these are the stages of chemical analysis. First, we weigh. After we weigh, we digest the sample. After digesting the sample, if it needs filtering, we'll filter it, then we'll titrate. So there's a short video here, you're able to see. So this is determination of copper by using hydrometry. The stages we say first is weighing, we weigh the sample, 0 0.3 grams. We'll put, we'll put in our beaker. So when we weigh, we we'll, we'll want to go digest it using the chemicals. So after it weighs, you record the mass of the sample. You put in clover, uh, watch glass covers. You prepare a starch solution, which is an indicator. An indicator is something that denotes color change during a titration. So you, you add a little bit of water. Then you add some acid, 10 ml of HCl. Now we are digesting the copper now. Then you put on heat. Then you add in 20 ml of a mixed acid of nitric acid and sulfuric acid in a ratio of 3 to 7. So you can see there are fumes. We've installed a very good chimney. These fumes don't come to us. They are, they are absorbed in the chimney. Then you add in some HF to further dissolve the sample. Then you add in some bromine. Mm. Then you add in some perchloric acid to further digest the material. As you can see, there's a little bit of blacks, black material in the sample. Then you shake and then you wait until it dissolves completely. Then you add in a little bit of nitric acid to further enhance the digestion. So now it's going to digest to nearly dry. So when the samples are ready, you remove the watch glass to allow the, the fumes to come out. When the fumes come out, it's nearly dry. You go on to other additions of chemicals, then it's ready for analysis. Yeah, so we put in a bit of drops of HCl. Then you put in some, uh, some urea. Then you wash, wash with water. Then you boil to digest the urea. Until the urea dissolves, you cool the sample.
At this stage now, we've done almost all the digestion is complete. Now the next stage is to mask, to remove, to mask the iron. So you put in some ammonium acetate buffer to mask the iron. So it will turn brown. And upon addition of the ammonium acetate, then after that you put in some HF, hydrogen fluoride, then the color will change to blue. Yeah. When it changes to blue, then it's ready for analysis. Yeah, and then you add one mu in excess of the HF. Then you rinse to make sure that there's no copper sticky on the walls. Then you put in a bit of ammonium uh, iodide. You swell, then titrate until the end point. So you see, our Chinese are very skillful. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. So any of the Zambia staff do the same thing? Yes, even me I do. You see me I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you get that blue, black color, we will put in addition of uh, five mules, potassium theocyanate, and then we continue titrating until our end point color, which is milky white. So that's what a titration looks like. So when I say titration, that's a titration. So it's almost near end point. It just has to wash now, rinse it off. So it's a good procedure how long it takes? It takes about uh, three hours, huh? Digestion and analysis and uh, titrating. But the goodness with the titration, you can do lots of beakers. He's able to do 20, 24 beakers. And also another friend opposite is doing 24, so we do 48. 24 sample. 24 sample a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then use that calculation to determine the concentration. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of our presentation. <laughs> thank you, Sheshe. It's me titrating with Misang there. Okay, question time. If no question time, I'll ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions, I can take in five questions. I still have for four minutes more. Oh, me, I'm a double major. I majored in chemistry and biology. I've worked in the hospital before. Yes, yeah. Now I work in the lab for mine. I think mining is better than hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the time of COVID. Ah, hospital wouldn't be a good idea to work there. To see if you are following. What is precision? Precision, we are not on the true value. We are, we are maybe probably close or we are off the true value. But they are falling in the same range, all the results. That's precision. Homogeneous. Who can give us the term? Same same. Same material. Same material. Okay, good. I know that we are following. Okay, let me give one more hard one now. Reproducibility. Good. Yes, different machines, different procedure, but same result. Good. It's reproducibility. Yeah. I think we're done. I'm satisfied. I know you are listening. Thank you.